Game on. We are back with Emil Vercade. Emil is going to teach us about extracting away complex logic through macros to unlock speed of development. Funny enough, this perfectly tags along yeah. to uh, how Carlos' talk ended. So Amy and other people that are curious how you can improve DBT, uh, this is a perfect example through macros. Um, again, my name is Parker Rogers. I'm hosting this session. If you look to the right of your screen, you will see that there's the Q&A in chat. Add all your questions for Emil in the Q&A. And with no further ado, Emil, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thanks so much, Parker. Um, so yeah, uh, Amy, I also saw your, um, your your question in the chat just there, and I, I figured, oh, that's that's kind of perfect segue into uh, into my talk. Um, but yeah, so I'm I'm Emil. I'm an analytics engineer at Snowpile. Uh, I'll be chatting a bit about how we at Snowpile basically have used DBT macros and also custom incrementalization to basically abstract away complex logic from uh, end users, but also from internal analytics engineers to basically help simplify how things work. Uh, when you interact with the uh, with the Snowplow packages, um, but also to kind of help increase uh, speed of development internally for us, because we want to be churning out basically quality data products, you know, uh, as quickly as possible. Um, so thanks so much for tuning into the talk. Hope you guys learned something useful. Um, and yeah, let's uh, let's get started. So um, basically, to start, what is Snowplow? I'll go over this very quickly. I don't want to do too much uh, marketing stuff, but hopefully this gives you kind of uh, a, a frame of reference through which to understand the talk. Um, Snowplow is basically an organization that allows you to collect, validate, enrich um, behavioral data that's generated usually on a web website, app, or server side. Um, we're pivoting more and more into general data creation. Um, so we're looking at being able to basically create data about any, any interaction that happens pretty much anywhere. Uh, but kind of the main pillars of, of, of how we've been working over the past 10 years is, again, to do with collecting, validating, enriching, uh, and also modeling that data. Um, and what's really cool, or at least what I think is really cool about um, about Snowplow is that all of our tools are open source. Anyone can use them. You don't have to pay for anything. Um, but if you pay for it, then you get this kind of managed service where we help um, in, in a similar way, abstract away the complexities of, of, of the general Snowplow product. Um, so to start kind of what we, what we really focus on is uh, behavioral data. And so, yeah, to start to give you an idea of like what behavioral data is, or at least what we mean by it. Um, so we have this little uh, this little short description here. Like data captures each action a user or service performs at a given time with a corresponding state. And to give kind of some examples um, of that, you can think about like uh, an, a, a behavioral data event is opening an email. And then a, a context that might be added to that is something like, does that email have an attachment? If yes, what is it? How big is it? Um, you know, any, any, any kind of data that that also adds uh, about this attachment can also be added to the general behavioral data of I've opened this email. Uh, you know, you can look at what time, all that kind of stuff. It's the same with like a page view. So when you visit a website, you, you, you view a certain page. What page did you visit? What browser version were you on? What was your IP address? Um, you know, did you consent to the cookies? Like all these extra things can be added context that we add on to the general behavioral um, page view event. Uh, similarly, changing channels on a, on a smart TV. What was the firmware? What app were you in? What apps maybe had you, been, had you previously been in before you got to this? How did you get to, to, to this specific channel? Um, and same with uh, logging into an app on your on your mobile phone. Was geolocation enabled? Were you Wi-Fi enabled? Were you on high battery, low battery? Um, were you working on 5G, 4G? Was you know, were you on roaming? All that kind of stuff could be contextual data that's added to the general kind of event of have you logged into your um, to your application. So how does kind of Snowplow work at a high level? Again, go through this quite quickly. Um, but the three kind of main steps. Uh, I mean, we talked about four before. So it's the generation of data, the, uh, the validation of data, the enrichment of data, and then the, the kind of modeling of data. And so to start here, you can see you have a little, I have a little code snippet included of, uh, of our JavaScript trackers. So we have trackers and SDKs for basically all the major programming language, languages. And you can embed this, uh, this, this little code snippet on your JavaScript front end. Um, you basically have to specify a collector URL here. And I'll talk a little bit about what a collector is in a second. Um, you can specify an app ID. And then you can include context of information about that web page. So what's the page ID, what's the title, you know, what's the link uh, or, or the URL path in general, uh, all that kind of stuff. But you can also include specific different custom context that you want or, or actual context that we provide ourselves. Um, but yeah, basically if you just add this snippet and a couple of other little things on your website, you're basically good to go at least as far as the tracking is concerned. And then you'll start generating behavioral data events and sending them to your, um, to your collector. And what your collector does after you've generated that data 
is it, um, it, it attempts to validate that data against these contexts and these schemas inside these contexts. So we uh, ask you to create basically JSON schemas uh, for all the different contexts you want. And that allows you to add things like we just uh, talked about with, uh, with opening emails, right? You can, add a, you can add an attachment context that has certain fields that might be required, might not be required, that have a certain format um, that you would expect and certainly you don't. Um, and we can kind of validate against that. And if any piece of data fails that validation, we send it to basically a bad, quote unquote, bad data stream, uh, usually landing in like elastic, uh, elastic or whatever. Um, and then you can kind of try and clean and process that data manually and fix kind of the issues before you send it into your good data stream. Um, so that way you don't lose any data. If you have, if your data passes validation, then we send it towards uh, the enricher. So again, this is all uh, this is all open source. But what this enricher can do is 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 add even more, or in in other words, enrich uh, the data that's already coming in, right? So if your data has already been validated, what the enricher can do, for example, is um, basically do query parsing, so you can see where did uh, where did this user come from, how did this user go on this page. You can do uh, IP lookups, so we can add inf uh, geographical information around where this user is come from where they've logged in, what, 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 what time zone they're in, all that kind of stuff. Um, and you can do pseudonymization. So if you're looking to be uh, GDR compliant or, or all the different uh, data governance issues, you can basically ensure that before the data even gets to your, to your data warehouse, it's already pseudonymized. Uh, you don't have to worry too much about exposing, um, exposing certain identifiable characteristics uh, yeah, to, to, to other users within your organization. And then once that kind of enrichment is done, it lands in your data warehouse or data lake house, whatever you want. And from that point onwards, we model it. And this is where we're hopefully going to get into the juicy stuff of this talk. Um, so right now here you can see on uh, DBT's package hub. So we use DBT and on DBT's package hub, we have four different packages at the moment. And I'll talk about all of them kind of in, in a little bit more detail, but what all of these packages basically serve to do is uh, if you just do snowplow without modeling, you get all this event level data, which is super interesting, super enriched um, and, and really valuable to your organization. But what we found is that a lot of organizations then get this data and don't really know what to do with it. I don't know if people here have worked with um, Clickstream data before, but you know, it's, it's quite complicated. There's a lot of problems you have to deal with. I mean, I'll go more into kind of what kind of problems you have to deal with, especially with web data in particular in a second. Um, but it's really nice for, for, for our users, we found that we're able to kind of model the data for them and and remove a lot of the complexities around dealing with and trying to understand web data, a mobile app data, media player data, all that kind of stuff. So I'll, I'll talk about that. And again, about how we use um, how we use macros and, and, and custom incrementalizations to make that a little bit easier for ourselves, but also for our um, for our end users. So how can you use our DBT package? So basically, as I mentioned, we have the web, the media player, the mobile package, and then uh, another utils package which we kind of use internally but has some nice helper functions that, that anyone can really, uh, that anyone can really leverage, but we build it specifically for our own package with our own packages in mind. And basically you can use any of these packages on BigQuery, Databricks, Redshift, Snowflake, Postgres, um, out of the box. Uh, if, if, if there's other, um, data warehousing technologies that, uh, that, that are interesting to us and that we're going to be uh, building the rest of our technology, uh, to be compatible with, then we're also obviously going to be expanding the support of PBT to, to be able to work on those, uh, on those different warehousing technologies. Um, what the packages basically do is they process data incrementally with little asterisks, and we'll get into what, what, what that exactly means in a bit. And they transform, again, these raw kind of quick stream events, you know, potentially billions of events into more aggregated derived tables that you can actually kind of leverage straight away into something uh, hopefully, hopefully a little bit useful. And how they do it is, again, by leveraging the Snowplow Utils package, um, which is kind of similar to what Carlos, Carlo was saying about like, the more complicated your project gets, the more you're likely to use macros. So we've, we've, we've taken that same philosophy and then dumped kind of all the macros in this, or most of the macros, at least in the Snowplow Utils package, so that we can leverage those same macros across the web package, the mobile package, the media player package, all, all, the, all those different things. Um, so let's kind of dive into an example, or, or at least let's dive a little bit more into, uh, into the web package and see how that all works. So if you're looking at clip, click stream data in general from, 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 from web, um, you're starting with all these raw events of like, uh, well, of like page views, page pings, clicking links, all that kind of stuff. And that can be, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of events uh, for some of our users, uh, some of our bigger users, at least. Um, we're seeing them process, you know, five to 10 billion events per month, um, which is an insane amount of data. And there's, you know, there's a lot you can do with data, but, 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 
10, 10 billion events or whatever is, 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 is kind of almost, uh, well, it's super hard to play around with. So if you start modeling that data and you start modeling uh, this, these raw events into page views where you get information about uh, how long someone has spent actually engaged with, with, with the content on the page, uh, how much they've been, how much they've been scrolling in the vertical, the horizontal direction, where did they previously come from? Where are they going? All that kind of, all, all those kinds of things. Um, you can get a lot more, like the data becomes a lot more useful and, you know, not by coincidence, but it also does become a lot smaller. So it reduces by around, we've seen on average by around a factor of five. Um, and basically, so we go from those raw events to those page views. Then later we go from the page views into sessions. So you want to see how those page views kind of construct together to build a session that a user has when logging into a website. Um, and equally to aggregate another level further, we look at how all of those different set, all of a specific user's sessions make up an actual user's kind of, um, kind of activity. And what's important is, you know, like I said, with, with the example of, of, of one of our users who's posting 10 billion events per, per month, um, what we're seeing is like storage costs have obviously gone down over, over the last 10 years and they're getting closer and closer to zero in terms of uh, uh, for the large uh, data warehouses. But compute costs are, are becoming an increasingly bigger, not, not necessarily cause of concern, but an increasingly bigger part of the budget. Um, and so we're, we're, we were thinking about if you're posting 10,000 10, or, or 10 billion events per, per, per month, whatever it is, we want to be we want to be doing something that's as efficient as possible. So we were looking into obviously we're not going to be creating um, views. We're not going to be creating drop and recompute tables, but instead we were thinking we, we, we have to leverage some sort of incremental framework to build these page views. Um, and these sessions uh, and these user views. Um, and how we did that is we, we were thinking either we can use DBT's like native incremental imp uh, implementation or we can use our own. So if we look at how the DBT native uh, incremental framework works, um, basically what would happen is you take your raw events, you identify all the new page view events that have, that have happened since you last processed the data. Uh, you find the session IDs of those new events and then you get all historical page view events associated to those specific session IDs. And once you have that, then you start to parse all these page views. Why would you need all the previous page view events from those same sessions? Well, the reason why is like, you wanna look at this data in a sequential manner. You wanna see how people uh, move through or funnel through your website. Uh, and so you'll need to kind of re look at some old page view data in that same session to basically correctly be able to identify the sequence through which um, through which people move through your website. So uh, a reason why that might also be necessary is because you could you often have late arriving data, there's stray page pings coming out, you know, uh, uh, hours or days later we've seen. Um, and so you wanna be able to make sure that when you process things and when you represent things in your data warehouse, you actually represent them accurately. Um, you know, to skip ahead a bit, you kind of have to do the same on the session level and the user level. You always have to come back to the page views, uh, then go to sessions, then go to users, and then reprocess everything, which, is fine. It's very easy to implement. It's all native DBT, so that's really good in, in terms of create like adding new support for new adapters, so new warehouses, all that kind of stuff. Um, but you kind of keep having to repeatedly identify new data, which which becomes quite intensive. You keep processing page views, which is a lot, and you know page views. While well, they are smaller than uh, than your raw events by a factor of five, if you're doing ten billion a month, that's still two billion page view events per, per month that you're processing. So those costs can kind of add up quite quickly. Um, and it becomes tricky to build incremental models off of the derived tables that, that come later. And I want to highlight that in the context of our next, uh, the next slide, which is where we talk about uh, Snowplow's incremental framework. So bear with me, the, the, the graph on the right is a little bit complicated, but I hope you'll see, and later you'll see it, it simplifies a lot. Um, basically what, what we start to do is from the raw events, we identify all the new events this run. So it doesn't, uh, all the new events since the last run, sorry. And we put them in an events this run. We find the session IDs from all of these new events. And then we select all historical events with, uh, that have been associated with those sessions. We dump them all in a drop and recompute events this run table. And that then becomes the source of data for all of our, for all of our incremental logic going forward in the same run. So what happens is these, if you're looking at page views this run, all you have to do is select star from this events this run table where the event name is page view and then you have all the page views you need for the um for this current run and then you can start to process those sequence those index those all that kind of stuff and when 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 you finish calculating all your aggregations you can upsert that into your derived into your actual page views table you can do the same with sessions um and and upsert that into your sessions table and the same with users essentially and upsert that into your uh users table 
So what's interesting about this is you can process all the event types uh, incrementally um, because basically the events this run forms the incremental foundation of this run. Um, and that means you can keep referring back to that. You don't have to worry about the incremental logic that's, that's happening underneath. You can always kind of be sure that this is, um, this is ensuring that these are all the events that, that you care about in this latest run. Um, it's a bit more, it, well, it is a lot more actually performed because you only have to or execute this incremental logic once, uh, which you put in this event this run. And then after that, you just keep referencing that. Um, you can improve testing capabilities because basically when you try to debug things, you can look at these scratch or temporary tables in the this run, um, well, the this run format. So events, page views, sessions, and users. And you can start to see, oh, this is why I'm, I'm kind of seeing data that I might not have expected, all that kind of stuff. Um, the cons are it's more complicated to implement and it's kind of difficult to run models asynchronously because you need this events, this run to basically be um, in sync all the time. So what were some considerations when we thought about which approach we wanted to take? We wanted to minimize costs for our users. We wanted to enable maximum flexibility and ease of use for our users again. And we wanted to reduce development time for us as uh, analytics engineers, but also our, the analytics engineers that actually end up using these packages. And so, you know, I hope it is kind of obvious that we took our, our current approach. Um, which is which is the kind of custom snowplow incremental uh, framework, but you know we're still we're still debating that to this day of whether we should move to something maybe a little bit simpler. Uh, but for now, this is kind of the approach approach that we have. And so, how does it work? I kind of want to show a little bit of the magic of it, and then we'll, we can go into the code a little bit. But basically, um, all you have to do is set up in your um, in your DBT model. You write in your configuration that the materialization is snowplow incremental, and then all you basically have to do is do a select star from. Uh, page views this run or sessions this run or uses this run. And then you already get all the incremental stuff, uh, you know, worked out for you. Um, and what, what's beautiful about this is what this compiles to. I mean, this is essentially four lines of SQL and maybe like 10 lines of a configuration that DBT then compiles into this huge, you know, hundreds of lines worth of uh, SQL, which is merged into web page views as whatever using select like star from this temp table, blah, 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 blah. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how that works in, in a sec, but that's, that's really powerful. And that's what we mean when we talk about like uh, simplifying it, the, the, the experience for the end user. So how does it work? Basically you write materialization so far incremental. Um, since this is a, a materialization that DBT doesn't recognize automatically, uh, it, it tries to look for it in your, your web package or mobile package, and then ends up finding it in your details. It finds the right adapter for the project. And I'll go into more detail on what, what that adapter actually does in a bit. And then it builds out that custom custom SQL for the user. So that's what we saw, where it goes from select star from this table to merge into whatever, whatever, uh, all that stuff. So to walk through a quick example from Databricks, here's some variables. I mean, you can look over the slides uh, slides later, not not too important, but these are kind of some of the variables that we what, that we want the users to specify in their configuration, the unique key, the upsert date key, the disable upsert look back. Um, and then we have some, um, some conditional logic that applies and I can actually walk through the code. Maybe that's a little bit, a little bit easier also conscious of time. Um, but yeah, so in the first, I don't know how visible this is, but in the first, like from line four until line 15, we're basically just setting the different variables. Uh, we're loading them in from the configuration and, 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 um, and yeah, just setting them into the scope of this function or into the scope of this materialization. Uh, then we have our conditional logic running from 23 line 23 to line 46. Um, but basically, if the uh, derived table doesn't yet exist, if it's currently a view, or if uh, you have this full refresh mode on, which is basically dbt run dash dash full refresh, um, then we're just going to create the table as new in, in, in a very simple way, select star from uh, page views this run. Otherwise, we're going to leverage this snowplow merge function to be able to create that, that uh, more complicated uh, SQL that you guys saw. Um, and then we're going to call that. Uh, and that's basically all we um, all we really do here. And so Snowplow Merge, we, uh, we we leverage a lot, as well as Snowplow is incremental, delete, insert, get upsert limits, all that stuff. And so we thought we'd move them into this kind of common repository. Uh, Snowplow Merge leverages the uh, dispatch functionality, which again, I will talk about uh, on the next slide, uh, removes the duplication of code, um, and that's related to the dispatch functionality. So basically, dispatch allows you to um, to create a macro and then Dispatch basically routes it to the right version or the right implementation of the macro, depending on which warehouse you're running on. Um, and some of the other macros uh, that we use commonly, we just put in the in the common folder. So they're all in one place, and it's easy to find them. Um, so this is how kind of the Snowplow merge works. So in the first three lines, you can see that's the general macro. So you have Snowplow merge, which in line two uses the dispatch dispatch functionality from DBT, um, and it just dispatches this function uh, or this macro call 
using the same arguments that, 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 that are sent. And then in, in, um, in line five, you can see that we have Snowplow merge again, but this time prefixed with Databricks double underscore. And so that's how you would, that's how DBT knows, oh, okay, for Databricks, I'm going to use this version of, um, of the macro. Um, maybe some interesting things to point out here. So you might realize, or you might, you might know this from, from using Snowflake or, or, or BigQuery, but Snowflake and BigQuery both have this like, um, set keyword that you can use to set temporary session, uh, session variables and give them values and then reference them later in that same session. Um, Databricks doesn't have that for some reason, which is completely fine because DBT has it instead. So what we can do is we can get the kind of limits uh, of, of when, where we need to upsert the data, the lower and the upper limit by, by running some query. And we can store that in a lower limit uh, variable, which we would normally set in, which we would normally set in or using the set keyword itself. But instead we can do that by uh, setting it within DBT and then referencing that later. And then we just create the merge query uh, and we run these different things. Um, so what are the implications of this custom materialization? So we're driving down compute costs, which is, which is great, right? We're writing something that's a lot more efficient than it needs to be. Um, the end user complexity is also really nice that we're kind of re reducing that as you guys saw, we do select star, uh, from, you know, use this run, which is great. Um, instead of writing, you know, thinking about the whole incremental logic that you would have to do with the uh, DBT native incrementalization. And we're improving the internal speed of development, which is fantastic. So for us, it took us like seven months to write. Uh, the web package, which was the first package that we released. And then after that, I joined, and within my first two months, I had written the, the mobile package, um, which was a lot simpler to do. Similarly, it took it took me three weeks, I think, to add support for Databricks as a whole on our web package. And then it took a colleague of mine two days to add that same support for our mobile package. So because we abstract a lot and we put a lot in our, in our utils package, we can kind of reference that um, later, which is really, really powerful. Um, how is this useful to you? Arguably the most, the most important slide of the, of the deck, which I left, uh, to the end. Um, basically what, what we at Snowpaw think uh, the right idea is, is to standardize your analytics process in the same way that you already standardized, uh, derived tables with DBT for your data consumers, right? So if you want to implement, uh, complex logic in your, um, in your analytics processes, an easy way to do that is to write that once and then start to leverage it again and again and again with macros. And if you start to, see macros as like helper functions. And, and as these kinds of resources, you might be able to unlock kind of a new development paradigm and start to think about more complex problems in a way um, that you can actually break down and deal with leveraging some really powerful macros. Um, and hopefully this also helped give you a head start into creating custom materializations. Um, if you can give me one more slide. Um, so some examples of some things you might wanna do um, is basically you can use macros or custom incrementalizations to add metadata or standard columns to different tables. So you might want to talk about how long things, you might want to add how long things took to execute at what time they were executed, um, how many rows were, you know, created this run, like all that, all those kinds of things you can add in a standardized automatic way using either macros or, um, or custom, uh, custom materializations. Similarly, adding com common date functions to so splitting things out or converting into different time zones and splitting out into date parts, hours, days, all that kind of stuff. It's something analysts know how to deal with, but it's a bit annoying. So it's, it's kind of nice to be able to do that with, um, with DBT macros. Similarly, if we're talking about data freshness, you can create, a, well, it's more like a hook, but you can create a macro to keep a manifest table to show when data was last updated for each of the different tables. Um, you can also push or pull data to S3 or your data lake um, easily with macros or again, incremental, um, or sorry, custom materializations. So macros would more be specifically for one model in general. And then if you wanted to create a custom materialization, you could uh, put that in your DBT project by YAML and basically use that across the board. Um, yeah. So that's kind of kind of the idea. Hopefully that helped a little bit. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. Sorry, we sped up a little bit at the end. There was just a, a lot a lot to say. If there's any questions, I'm happy to uh, happy to answer them. Am I? Oh. Um, so. There is one question first from Jeff Huth. It's on the screen. Uh, what is the best way to get raw Snowplow data into my data warehouse? Extract load with five trainer error byte stitch, stream loading with AWS, Kinesis, Snowflake shared DB. Um, no, so the best is just to, um, is to just have your, basically have your uh, tracker send data to a collector that you, that you orchestrate um, somewhere. And then we usually, we usually, I mean, depending on what the, uh, what cloud infrastructure you have, you can use AWS uh, Kinesis or you can use PubSub or whatever you want um, to, to stream that data into your data warehouse. So 
you don't need to pay for uh, an extra tool like five strand airbyte or stitch you can just use uh, kind of the streaming technologies of aws and gcp that you probably already have access to if you um if you use those cloud providers and um, we'd say that's the easiest way because then you can also go through the validation and the enrichment process um that yeah that we've that we've created and mariah rogers says do you have any blog posts or articles describing a use case for implementing this custom materialization of those examples uh, Put on the spot there. A, yeah that's a great <laughs> question um there's a couple that I saw of like so specifically for the examples I found. There were a couple of blog posts, so I can I can put those uh, I can put those in Slack in the Slack community if if, if that's easiest. Um, with regards to our actual custom materialization, I'd have to check. I mean, it kind of predated me in the company, um, but if we haven't written a, a blog post already, I'll probably have to write one after uh, after the tail end of this talk. So so maybe it'll it'll come very soon. But I'll, I'll find that and, and also put that in Slack if that's the case. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be great to have that to Slack. I'd like to read that too. And then uh, Mariah Rogers again. When will Snowplow come out with streaming loader Oof. for Snowflake on GCP? On yeah, the spot that's a great again. question. <laughs> um, yeah, that one I, uh, I I definitely don't know. Uh, I can get back to, or I can ask some of our engineers and uh, and get back to you, Mariah. And we can we can link up on the um, on the OA Slack and uh, and and I can put you in the loop there. But uh, unfortunately, I don't know. I'm sorry. It's a lame answer. And then previous presenter Carlos Scalisi is set a new dbt jinja function um i'm not sure i mean it's been there since 1.0 um at least I, I don't know if it's been there uh, before then but uh no i mean i've only i mean i only found it out of necessity because i was banging my head against the wall trying to get this uh this uh databricks uh, incrementalization to work and uh, then i stumbled on set so it might be just a bit underused but as far as i'm aware it's not it's not very new uh no awesome and uh, this one's for me. I'm just curious if if you wanted someone to take away one very specific thing from this session, what would it be? Start learning about macros. It's kind of like what Carlo was saying. Like it, it took it took them a year, um, and and fair enough. Like I think a lot of times you think, yeah, I probably don't need it. My my use case is probably not that complicated, and you're you're likely right. But what I was saying uh, in in kind of the the two slides ago about how starting to use macros can, can give you this paradigm shift and start thinking about problems in a different way. I think that's the really powerful part of starting to leverage them, even when you might not yet need to. So regardless of how complicated or how simple your use case is, I would say you start using macros kind of as much as you can, and you'll be surprised to see like how your, your, your mindset around, around data analytics and analytics engineering changes in a similar way to like, you know, kind of, when you start to use a lot of objects and object oriented programming, you start to think about the problems in a very different way. I think, you know, I'm not saying this is as revolutionary as that, but, uh, but I do think there's a lot of merit to, to, to trying to employ more macros and then seeing how your mind shift kind of changes around a lot of analytical uh, problems. So sorry if that's a bit long, but hopefully that, that was, uh, no, that's amazing. I need a macro of sorts because I'm repeating the same thing at the end of each session. So if you guys exactly. want to learn more from Carlo, uh, <laughs> You click on the right of your screen up top and join the club and you guys can ask him questions there. And Perfect. with that, Car oh my gosh, I just called you Carlo. My bad. It's all good. It's all good. So all good. Yeah, yeah, no, all good. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Sasha Osipova and we will be back in about one minute. Thanks a ton.